Looks like they're about to start. Let's go. Let's get the show on the road. Start 12.45, okay. Hmm. We have minutes then. Mary Pat, do you know what the speaker is gonna speak about today? The uh, army officer? No, I sure don't. I, I, didn't, um, I didn't read anything about her bio. Jerry and I were wondering a lot about that earlier. Oh, there's Davis. Yep, here I am. Hey there, how Hi, are Dave. you? I'm fine. Hey, how are you? Pretty good. How y'all doing? Doing good. good. Well, I've lost y'all. They just haven't started yet. Okay, good. Yeah, Dave, you haven't missed anything. <laughs> well, I saw y'all a while ago, and now I don't. They said um, 1245. Okay. How y'all been? Can't been complain. Doing all right. Speaker is Major Gilliam Erickson. Didn't it say she's stationed in St. Augustine? Oh, I don't know. Let me look. It does say she lives in St. Augustine. I thought I remembered reading that. Years ago, I knew the, the general that was head of the Florida National Guard. He was from Tampa, but he lived in St. Augustine when he was on active duty with the guard. So they must have a headquarters there or something. I think that's right. I think that's where the commanding general uh, has his headquarters. Yeah. You see the Orlick? Just the photographs, but sure is nice to have her tied up downtown. Uh, yeah, we went down there um, Sunday just to do a drive by, and it was nice to see it. It it looks really good. Mm -hmm. I look forward to seeing it too. A lot of people were down there just taking pictures and walking around. At long last. Yes. That's been an uphill battle for us to get a ship in here. It sure has. I don't know Bad. why I, I expected it to be bigger. That class of destroyers really isn't very big. I think she's around 3,000 tons, which is not, which is not really very large for a Navy ship. No. 
it's good that um, we had something that size, so it's not too overwhelming in, you know, on the riverfront. Mm -hmm. The Navy destroyers are the work workhorses of the surface Navy, or at least in, in decades past have been. They were originally designed to uh, combat submarines. So they were uh, deliberately not very big, but very fast and maneuverable. But as the years went by, more and more missions got added on. Is that the same one that escorts carriers? Uh, you would you would see some destroyers in the group, um, but not not the only not they would not be the only ships that escort carriers. Yeah. That would be one of their duties, but they have others too that don't involve carriers, you know, like anti-submarine operations. Yeah. You want to wear, read a hair-raising thing about a certain class of destroyers in World War II. They they created a class called destroyer escorts, and as the uh, Navy moved up the island chain in the, in the Pacific and they got started getting close to the home islands, um, the f fighting really got bad. And that's when the kamikaze started coming out of Japan and, and going after the Navy ships. And um, the Navy got the idea of positioning um, these smaller destroyers, destroyer escorts, way out ahead of the fleet of the formation with the aircraft carrier in it, so that when the kamikazes came heading south, the destroyer escorts could see them and relay a warning uh, to the uh, aircraft carrier and its escorts, and they would uh, be ready for the kamikazes when they came in. Welcome to the March 30th meeting of the Rotary Club of West Jacksonville. Uh, Zoom attendees, please mute yourself and uh, communicate with us via the chat function. Our invocation will be given by Shep College, and I'd like Brandon Hilliard to come up and lead us in the pledge after that. Dear Lord, thank you for all that you have given us and all that you have forgiven us. We thank you for the food that we're about to receive and are receiving. Please continue to give us the wisdom and the strength to provide in all the rotary services that we do. Amen. Please place your hand on your heart, face the flag, and recite the pledge with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Shep. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, I'd like to also thank Ron Roberts for a greeting today. Good job, Ron. Thank you. Um, don't miss the next social coming up. It's going to be May the 4th. Um, William and Lee are working on details. Uh, William and Lee are working on details, uh, but it's going to be May the 4th. We'll have an after hour social instead of lunch. Uh, we may co-host with the Riverside Club. Don't know. Uh, speaking of the Riverside Club, uh, last week's blood drive was a big, big success. Uh, we had a great turnout with Riverside Club, a great turnout from West Jacks, and a lot of the Timaquana staff also donated. So I think they were here from seven in the morning until three, two or three in the afternoon, and they get 20 to 25 uh, donations. So really, really good day for the, the blood drive. Uh, thanks, Tom Schneider, for coordinating that event. And uh, we're back on a more consistent schedule. So uh, the next time the bus comes is the next time you can donate. So tell his wife. Um, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Mike Fish to come up and do a pop-up, followed by Jackie Culver. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, who here attended our first annual 
Boy Scout uh, Rotary Function last year at Camp Chockety. A couple of us. Okay, had fun, right? Um, I wish Carter was here because that was the, the best comment I heard last year. Carter's kids, at the end of the day, has said, Dad, this was the best day ever. I know, it was great. I brought a little tear to my eye, too. It made me feel proud that the kids had such fun. Well, this year, about three and a half weeks from now, we're holding our second annual day at Camp Achocity. So please, you, your family, grandchildren, children, everybody, come out to Camp Achocity. It will be Sunday the 24th. We're going to have the entire camp open. BB Guns, Archery, we'll have uh, a dinner there. It's not going to be atypical camp food, but it will see camp food. Uh, but look, we'll feed you, have some, uh, have some fun, and enjoy a day at camp. Thank you, sir. Hello, everybody. Um, everyone should have a flyer on their table. Uh, since everyone enjoyed Chandra Manning's presentation on hearing health so much, I wanted to invite everyone to come out to meet and greet uh, with Jacksonville Speech and Hearing Center at Manifest Distillery on um, April 13th at 530. Uh, we have recently, through a grant from the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund, launched our mobile clinic so that we can be out in the community and reaching people who previously did not have access to hearing and speech and communication healthcare. So we'll have that unit out if you want to get your hearing tested and just join us for fun and to learn more and snacks and drinks. Thank you, Jackie. You had me at Manifest Distillery. And thank you, Mike. You had me at BB Guns. Um, Rotary Club of South Jacksonville will be hosting a casino night uh, May 7th. Um, very excited about that. If you want more details about the casino night for Rotary Club of South Jacks, just see me after the meeting. Uh, family of Rotary, Lee Davis, followed by the Sergeant Arms Report with Rahul Sharma. Thank you very much, President Ike. First of all, we'd like to welcome back Meredith, one of our members who just returned from Israel and had an awesome time. And she She's thinking about getting a um, presentation for us to be able to see all the pictures and also we're real excited about that. I'd like to say congratulations to Gigi Carroll on the birth of her grandson Wyatt on March the 26th. All is doing well. And he's cute as a button. Um, some other news, Ed Pratt Daniels is in the hospital right now at St. Vincent's with a heart related edema and texts and emails are welcome but no visitors yet please. So we've got a lot of birthdays this week. We have Joe Springer on the 29th. Happy birthday, Joe. Chris. He gets younger every year. Chris Berger and Ed Pratt Daniels are on the 31st. Judge Wallace is on April 1st. Happy birthday, Judge. And we have two on the 3rd, Robert Pavalka and Skip College. So happy birthday. Thank you very much. Lee Davis, thank you so much for sharing the family of Rotary Report. I know I'm, a, I'm a too loud. Am I breaking the decibel levels here? Coach Springer, what's the deal here? Uh, you know, I always uh, want to make sure that folks can hear me. I think it's fair to say that I may have blown the speaker right there. Coach Springer will keep up with me. I like that a lot. I, I'll tell you guys, I, every week I'm so privileged to be able to welcome community members, leaders to our club. Uh, it's a responsibility that I, I take very seriously, but I'm honored to do so. But before I do that, uh, I'd like to take a moment to thank our broadcast engineer, Joe Springer, uh, for helping put together today's broadcast for our meeting today. Joe, thank you. Our Rotary Club is versatile, in-person, video, virtual conference. So there's many ways that you can receive the Rotary message each and every week. Joe, we appreciate it. And also for our Rotary Air Traffic Control Tower, Stu Irwin, Patty Chapman, making sure that our Rotarians arrive safely and depart safely. How about a round of applause for those two? Visiting Rotarians and guests today, it's gonna to be a great presentation, but uh, I'd like to first begin by uh, welcoming back to our club from the Rotary Club of South Jacks. If you would please stand for an ovation. Les Loggins is here with us, ladies and gentlemen. Les, welcome. 
Last, last time we were together on the occasion of the Rotary Speech Contest, always one of the great traditions at Rotary. Great to see you again here uh, today. Uh, our guests today, uh, they do great work in, in the community and certainly help us remind all of us about the importance of service above self. Uh, from the US Army joining us here today, Chief of Advertising and Public Affairs, April Johnson is here. April, please stand. Welcome, April. Social media manager of the US Army, making sure everyone's well connected and in the know. Ashlyn Graham is here. Ashlyn, please stand. Welcome. Welcome. Staff Sergeant with the US Army and virtual recruiter, Jennifer Doctors here. Staff Sergeant, please stand. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Rowland is back again this week. Uh, Back to back week, Stephen Rowland, Naples Rotary Club, but also affiliated with Business Valuation Incorporated and Heritage Capital. Stephen, it's great to see you back here at our club. Welcome, Stephen Rowland. You know, it, it is so important each week that you all understand the importance of energy and uplifting others, no matter what the backdrop is, no matter what type of day we're having. And it's my pledge to you, it's my duty, and it's my honor uh, to make sure that I remind all of our Rotary brothers and sisters that we all have a power, a power to use language, to share ideas, to touch hearts, and to bring about change in this world. As Rotarians, we all have this power to speak and to share, to explain and to educate to inspire and to influence. It is our responsibility to share these ideas and share our talents to find meaning in other people's messages. We use our skills to provide service to others less fortunate and help them to be self-sustaining. Each of us continued to grow as Rotarians. I know that I am. And so that we stand in our community as a symbol of those willing to freely put service above self and make this our community and the world a better place to live. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no better example of putting service above self than the speaker that we're going to introduce to you all today. We are honored to welcome someone who is a leader someone that will share their experiences with us, that will inspire us in the great work that we do for Rotary. Here to do the honors of introducing our guest speaker today, I just briefly mentioned, mentioned him to you all. Les Loggins is here with Rotary of South Jacks. Les, please come up to the podium and introduce our speaker. Les Loggins, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? You can. Rotary brothers and sisters stand next to each other, even in the face of adversity, <laughs> such as a mic fall. But let's let's try this position here. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Is that working? <laughs> Every time I get to a, a podium, I've got to lower that darn thing. Um, I would just like to. Uh, uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, you know, I, I visit your club each year when you have the, uh, the uh, oratory contest. And, uh, and being from South Jacksonville, we really appreciate your participation in, in that great event. Um, and, and thanks to what you're doing. And then uh, also uh, the, the Army is a big factor in that. And uh, they've been a sponsor for almost day one. And so that's why we're so closely connected with the Army, and we want to assist them in, in every way we possibly can. But because of your help and the Army's help, uh, we've, we had our eighth contest this year, and we have been able to donate over $100,000 in scholarships. So thank you very much for that. Um, it's, it's really a great honor uh, for me to, uh, to be able to introduce your speaker, President uh, 
I said, you know, he'd, he'd like us to do it. And, and I am very delighted to, I know that, uh, uh, our speaker's resume is, has been in your bulletin. It's a very extensive one and it's, and it's almost unbelievable what she's been able to accomplish. And I don't, I don't want to go into all of that. I'm sure she'll touch on a few of it, but I just want to mention a couple of highlights. Um, our speaker is, I don't know if you'll find anybody who's more educated than our speaker today. Uh, she has a, a, a degree in political science and geology, a degree in secondary education and economics, and a master's in emergency management. Um, I, I don't know how you, you have time to, to do anything other than study, um, but uh, uh, our speaker is, is, is Major Jillian Erickson, and Major is uh, enlisted in the Army as a specialist E4 training in paralegal and uh, becoming a paratrooper. She served in Germany and Afghanistan and uh, she is currently serving as the executive officer for the Jacksonville Recruiting Battalion. So it's with great honor that I introduce our speaker, Major Jillian Erickson. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for having the Jacksonville Recruiting Battalion here. Uh, I not used to standing behind a podium. I'm actually started in the army yelling at a bunch of soldiers. So I'm just kind of going to walk around a little bit. Uh, what I wanted to talk to you about is uh, I'm going to start and talk about what the army means to me, a little bit about what the army has given myself and my uh, children, and also um, what I would hopefully ask you to do to help us uh, in the future with the army. So um, as it was previously said, yes, uh, as you can tell, it's not like I sat around for eight years and constantly went to college. I'm, I'm not really that young, but thank you. I do appreciate that. So right out of high school, I did go to college. Um, I didn't think about joining the uh, army. I thought about just going to college like my parents told me to. And, and uh, I was gonna become a lawyer, that didn't work out. Then I went back to college, just become a teacher. And that did work out. Uh, I was a high school biology and social science teacher uh, for 10 years. I'm originally from Ohio up on Lake Erie. So I taught in Ohio and I was a coach. And what I realized was that I was uh, shaping young kids' lives by being a coach. And that's what I liked uh, about that job. Then uh, my husband and I, he was transferred to Florida. And I taught um, school on the West Coast in Fort Myers. Um, during that whole time, I had always heard my uh, father talk about the military, and in the back of my mind, I always thought that I would have liked to have served, uh, but I was serving in a different capacity. But um, during the early 2000s, we know what happened. I was sitting in the classroom teaching history down at Dunbar High School in Fort Myers well, when uh, we started our, uh, our war and our, the attack on America. And I remember standing there telling the kids, they were juniors and seniors, what a horrible thing had happened and how we were, we, we didn't know what was gonna happen. It was such uncertain times. And everyone was scared. Uh, I had uh, two little boys at that time. They were two years apart. They were just little toddlers. And I kept thinking that uh, I was so scared because I didn't know what the future was gonna hold. Um, but then something happened. Um, we heard that our military was going and I stopped being afraid anymore because I had learned that when I said, when I heard that our army was going, then I knew everything was gonna be okay. So I continued to teach for a few more years and I must've done a really good job as a history teacher because I turned around and a bunch of my graduates were joining the service and going off to defend our country. And after about 2006, at the end of the school year, I realized that um, I had been teaching them so good, but see, I'd been standing behind the flag teaching them, and they'd been standing in front of the flag defending my rights to teach them. And so I went home and told my husband that it was time that I stood in front of the flag. Now, I wasn't, I had two children, I had a husband, and I wasn't very, um, young 
at that point. I was older. So I didn't know if the Army would take me or not, but I was going to call and see if I could. So I called the recruiter, and I told him who I was and how old I was and that I had two bachelor degrees, and I'd been a school teacher. And he said, how many degrees? And I told him, he goes, you need to come in right now. And so I went in, talked to the recruiter, and I didn't tell my husband. And then I came home and told him. <laughs> and he said, um, well, OK. All right, if this is something you want to do, have kids, we'll travel. That's going to be our motto for the next four years. And so um, when I went back to the recruiter, I, they talked to me about becoming an officer. And I said, I can't lead a bunch of soldiers if I've never been in the Army. This was how I felt. And so I said, I need to enlist. I need to figure out what it's like to be out in the field and do all the grunt work and to mop. I need to learn all of that. And then I can lead those soldiers. I need to have someone telling me to go up that hill or bust in that door. And so I joined and enlisted um, and uh, I wanted, I went to be a paralegal. And what I found out as soon as I joined the army was something amazing, which I tell people that I, we recruit all the time. Anything you wanna do, you can do in the army. You just have to ask. There are 150 jobs. There are so many opportunities, there are so many schools, there are so many certificates that you can get that are not just in the Army, but applicable to the civilian world. And so I went into the Army a little older and I decided that anything that I ever wanted to do, I was gonna ask. And the greatest thing was they would pay for it. I thought that was just amazing when I found that out. So I went to boot camp. And that was interesting. I guess it's basic training now. And that was pretty funny. I didn't know we were all together. The first day they called, had called home and I told my husband, we're together at basic training. He's like, what did you think was going to happen? I said, I don't know, but uh, this is going to be really interesting. He said, just think that, you know, you're like their older sister. <laughs> so I embraced it. Then I went to be a, um, went to become a paralegal. And I was at Fort Jackson and somebody, we came down at 6 a.m. to stand for PT and I'd been an athlete in college and I had still been running and swimming. And so someone said, if you wanna go to airborne school, if you wanna jump out of airplanes, stand over there. I raised my hand and I ran over there. And uh, they said, okay, that's fine. We're gonna start working. They threw a flak jacket on me and said, go run six miles. And so we did. And every morning we did, and we did pull-ups, and we got PT, and um, at the end of become, when I graduated from being a paralegal, they sent me to airborne school. I didn't realize I was, to this day, the oldest female to graduate from airborne school. I still hold that distinction. Uh, a lot of Tylenol I took every single night, and every night after dinner, I fell sound asleep where they were all up chatting. And um, I found some like-minded people at airborne school by me, did everything that the black hats told me. And in the end, I got to jump out of airplanes. Now, what better thing? You I mean, my gosh, I think when I was a kid and I went skydiving with my father, he must have paid an exorbitant amount of money. But the army is just letting me jump out for free. So I thought this is the way to go. Um, so then I got stationed with uh, Fort Bragg, 82nd Airborne. And uh, I went to 82nd Airborne. I became a paralegal specialist. As soon as I got there, they said, uh, well, that's great. We're going to put you in this uh, brigade and you're going to go over to Iraq and you're going to do detainee operations. And I was like, what is that? So that's what I did for 82nd Airborne. Whenever we got uh, detainees, there's a lot of paperwork to make everything legal. And so that was me. I was the only female in a battalion of paratroopers. And when I told my husband about that, he laughed and laughed. He's like, of course, they're going to pick you. You are non-threatening. And you'll yell at all those young guys. And I did. So I was a specialist, though. That's an E4. Um, I, was in, I was there for about four months when my major, who was a lawyer, a uh, JAG lawyer, said, you need to become an officer. This is not the right path for you. And so I said, well, that would be nice. I'm learning. 
I'd already been out to the field. I'd been jumping. I'd been cutting Constantina wire. And I thought, well, I, I understand what it's like now. I can relate to the soldiers. So um, the Army has a bunch of different ways to become an officer, but the officer candidate school, you can sit through a bunch of boards or generals, which most people don't know, uh, division general has 18 soldiers that he can pick a year that he just, two sentences that change your life. They writes two sentences. I general select this person for officer candidate school. And I was general selected by General Scaparati. He was the division commander of 82nd Airborne. And so in 2009, after he signed that two sentences, um, two weeks later, I was at officer candidate school. My husband and my boys were up in Ohio with my parents and I was uh, becoming an officer and it was wonderful. But what I realized again was all you have to do is ask. And if the army thinks that you're qualified, they're gonna send you to the training and they're gonna change your life. Those two sentences changed my life. Um, since then, I, I am a chemical officer, chemical, biological, and nuclear war officer. That's my official uh, military occupational specialty, uh, MOS, that I said there were 150 of those in the Army. Um, I've never had to learn so much chemistry in my life. I could not believe that I had to learn all this chemistry, um, but it's very obviously important for that MOS. But um, also I'm EOD. I don't know if you know what that is. If it's the bombs that we walk out in the big suits. Uh, it's called the 100 foot walk in the big suits. I'm one of those hybrids that's a chemical officer and EOD. So I've gotten to be a company commander of EOD. I've gotten to be, um, um, I've gotten to do chemical uh, warfare work. And the hardest assignment I've ever had, I have to say was the last four years when the army had to send me to Key West, Florida. It was terrible, terrible. Had to buy the boat and go fishing. But um, a lot of you probably don't know, but the, the government has an amazing organization down there called Jayet of South. It's Joint International Agency Task Force South. And their entire mission, the 530 uh, people who are there representing 16 countries in Central and South America, all the branches and all the government agencies are there at Jayet of South. And our entire mission was facilitating the Coast Guard, because they're amazing if you don't know that. Coast Guard ships and the Navy ships and our partner nation ships uh, in defending the Southern border. Uh, we defended it from narcotics and also from everything else that gets shipped from Central and South America up into uh, the soft belly of the country. So that was a wonderful assignment that broadened my brain. I couldn't believe that they would let me do this and that they would let me live in Key West, but also that this amazing opportunity and what the government uh, did and the military. So now I'm here in Jacksonville. It was another hard, tough assignment when they sent me to Northern Florida, but I embraced it. And uh, I'm um, the executive officer of the battalion, the recruiting battalion. And that's really what I'm here to talk to you about. But I did get my master's degree while I was in Key West. Um, but my children are amazing. I have a junior at University of Alabama and I have a freshman at Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale. And what I wanted to say is that the army also gave me something called the GI Bill. So I've never paid a penny for my oldest son who's a junior at University of Alabama to go to school. I've never had to pay a penny for him. Uh, so now instead of putting two through uh, the military or through college, I only had to concentrate on the younger one. So that's another thing that the army and gives you if you serve four years or 20 years as the ability for you to give that. Now you can keep it and use it yourself and you can go to college full time. You can if you have your bachelor degree, you can get out with your bachelor degree because while they're in the army, 
there's something called tuition assistance. And that's what I use to get my master degree. The VA pays your degree, your courses while you're in the army active duty. So I didn't pay a penny for my master degree, not a penny. And it took me three years to do it slowly, but it was something I felt very, uh, you know, something I wanted to do. And it was very important. But what, I'm, what I said is the same thing. The army paid for it. So you can go, a young prospect can come right out of high school. They can join the army for four years. While they're there, they can go to college. St. Leo College in Florida, if you're not aware of them, they're one of our, we're their biggest contributor to their institution. I went there and visited. My son ran in the national cross country championships for division two this year. And I was there yelling and cheering him on. And uh, I talked to the people at, at St. Leo and they have army people from all over the world taking courses there. So tuition and it's free. The VA pays for it in the army. Then when you get out, you can use your GI bill get your master degree, get your law degree, uh, be a physician assistant, uh, anything you want. And so that's something else that the army offers. And so there's all of these things you can do by just raising your hand. Now, um, times are interesting in this country because we um, are competing. Not all the kids nowadays wanna stand in front of the flag. Some of them wanna sit behind the flag or they don't understand. Or they don't have grandma and grand, grandma and grandpa telling them about the depression and World War II and all of that. And so they don't always understand about selfless service, which is amazing that I'm here because you are all about selfless service. And I'm standing here about selfless service too. But what the interesting thing about uh, these young people is, is that for one of the first times in recent memory, the army and all of the other services are competing against those businesses, Amazon, every other uh, um, business in hiring these young people. And every day we see a commercial telling them the great wages they can have and that now they're paying for them to go to school. I wonder where they heard that from, those businesses. And that they could support uh, their families and there's health insurance and 401ks everything that we've been giving all along. Now you have all these businesses who have, are following the army. We are a corporation, a business, and we are competing for those same people. But what those commercials don't tell those kids is that once they get that wage, they have to pay for their health care, their housing, their rent, all of that. Where in the army, we give them a base salary, then we give them financial help for their housing and your health care is for free and you have your retirement. Plus we have a 401k on top that's 100% matched for the first four years you're in. And you only have to work for 20 years and to retire from the army. So the other things they don't tell everybody are the benefits that we don't speak about. And of course, all of the certifications. I got all my Microsoft certifications while I was in because I needed to learn how to do all these programs because I was not raised, I was raised in the floppy disk era. And so I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, got my Blackboard certification too, because we use that PowerPoint. The same things that my son's getting with his minor in computer science at University of Alabama, I was taking the same courses but I wasn't paying his tuition. So it was, the army was giving that to me for free. Those are all of the different benefits that they give, plus travel. We lived in Germany for four years. How can you beat that? My, we traveled all over Europe. Um, we uh, lived in Colorado. When we were there, we were skiing in Colorado Springs. We lived beautiful North Carolina, Key West. All of those places uh, we have lived all over the country and the army has moved us there and put us there. So those are all of the benefits that a lot of these 
kids in this country and not just in high school, but grads, because we like having people that have been out of the uh, high school for a few years to join. But because of this era that we live in and the competition, for the first time ever, the, um, the, uh, the Army is also giving $50,000 in bonuses if you enlist in the Army, up to $50,000 in bonuses. The bonuses are, they started about uh, 30 to 60 days ago. The bonuses are contingent on a few things. Uh, what um, occupation they pick, these kids, because we want the best and the brightest how quick they'll ship and go and join the army. And also um, the, um, well, the branch, what skills they have, possibly what education they have. Like me, I graduated from, you know, I had already had a degree. And also, they're also instituting other things uh, such as uh, stabilization. So I told, we lived, we uh, lived in 14 different places until my children, were in high school and they stabilized me in Key West so they could graduate from high school there. But now you're allowed to stay in one base. You can take that option where you can spend eight, 10, 12 years there and watch your children grow up in one location. But the other thing is that you can also pick your duty station, your first one. So uh, we have, and they've added uh, CONUS, they've added Hawaii and Germany now to that mix. So we're giving a lot of different um, competitive packages, hiring packages, you could say, to um, hope to inspire uh, prospects to come and join the Army. What I wanted to do while I was here was tell you that, tell you that through my own story, I got to do all of these things and also um, what the Army is offering. There are recruiters all over who go to high schools, who uh, go out into the community. We have different events uh, that we go and host and sponsor. And they're all talking to the um, prospects. But what I'd like you to do is I'm asking you to go out into the community, please, and um, talk about what we have to offer and uh, what it is about the Army that I think is so unique and I'm not the only person. And you can talk to um, people all around the army and they'll tell you their stories and they're amazing, which is the, one of the other great things about the army. Um, I grew up in a little town in Northeast Ohio. To this day, they still don't lock their doors and uh, they still don't. They still have their screen doors open all summer. And, uh, and that was wonderful, but I, got to experience life and once I joined the army and everybody's lives and all of the diversity and strength that our country has based on diversity. Our strength comes from diversity and the army is one of the greatest diversifiers in this country. You take people from all walks of life, unify them together, tell them to stand in front of that flag and defend the rights of everybody else in that country and we willingly do it. And that's what happened. And when I spent that six last 15 and a half months uh, in Afghanistan this last time, that's what I kept thinking. I watched people who had no rights. And so the army is there to give you your rights and for let you go and do all of these wonderful things. And so I hope that you'll go out and tell um, the story of the army. It's our country and we have to protect it. I think it's all fair to say that we have a leader uh, upon us today on stage, uh, Major Jillian Erickson, a great presentation. Thank you for joining us today. At this time, if you have a question that you would like to ask uh, Major Erickson, if you just raise your hand and I will come over to you. We have uh, time for a couple of questions and I'll make my way over. Uh, Gigi has a uh, question. Hi, how, how is recruitment going? I mean, you're competing, but this year compared to last year, compared to five years ago, um, in numbers or percentages, how is our army as far as personnel goes and, and what needs that have to be filled? 
Um, that's, that's a very good question. I'm gonna answer a little bit of it and then I'll probably have my um, our recruiter, Staff Sergeant Alonzo come up. What I'm trying to tell you is recruiting is different now than it was five years ago or six years ago. Back then, you could sit in the office, a recruiter, and people just walked in the door. They just walked in. You just sat there and filled out the paperwork. You took them to the MEPS. They processed. They went and served. That's not the case now. The last 18 months, two years, it's been a shift. Now we have to go out and sell ourselves more. You have to go out, not to you, but to the younger generation. So our numbers have dipped. The reason being is that our recruiters aren't used to that and they had to come back and do that again. Um, but overall, it's not just us. It's all the services are seeing a dip. Now, at the bathtub, that's what we call it. And it'll, it'll work its way out. But right now, you don't really want time to work your way out. Because see, we have attrition. We have soldiers retiring and getting out after four years, eight years, 10 years. And so we have to fill that gap because it's a year of training just to get them out of entry level into the service. So yes, Sergeant Alonzo, would you like to add anything to that? I'm Staff Sergeant Alonzo once again. Um, also because of the COVID, I would say, we're also struggling with recruiting, but we have maximized our efforts by using virtual recruiting. So we're also trying to reach to the masses via Facebook, via Indeed, um, you know, any kind of, how can I say it, like virtual, through social media. But the other thing as well that we struggle with is with these applicants or these prospects, these leads passing the ASVAP test, the aptitude, um, the armed services vocational aptitude battery test. And that test is pretty much what allows people to, you know, tell us like, are they qualified to meet the job requirements, not just the job requirements, but to enlist in the army or into any, any branch. And honestly, that's where we're struggling the most at as well. Um, some of these applicants cannot pass the ASVAP test. So that is our number one struggle in recruiting. So a unique uh, side note to that, we're the only test, standardized test that does not allow calculators. Every other standardized test, college entrance exams, everything allow calculators. We do not, and I don't know, you've tried to see people make change, right, in the store lately? Well, that is one of the problems with the ASVAP. So one of the biggest things we're doing in the Army and the, all the other uh, services is talking to educators. I mean, about this simple thing. You can't have a soldier out in the middle of Afghanistan or desert say, oh, let me get my calculator. You have to be able to do it in your brain, the simple things. And that's one of the things we're struggling with right now also with the ASVAB. Major Erickson, we got two questions. Dr. Randy Thornton, followed by Carl Dawson. I can certainly appreciate the competition you face in recruitment from the private community, but we're in a huge Navy town here. And say you have an 18 year old who's trying to decide between the Navy and the Army, what would you tell them? Oh, well, um, <laughs> I know what I'd tell them, but. Um, <laughs> right. What, what's interesting about that is that there are different things as Navy offers the Army, off, that, that we have different things that we offer. Um, the Navy also, right now, they don't, the Navy, Marines, Air Force, they're not giving any bonuses at all. It's just the Army right now. So none of them have done this. Um, and so that's what I would tell them. I would also tell them that you're not gonna get some of those certifications. Um, cyber is a massive, uh, um, uh, requ uh, we require a huge amount of uh, cyber in the army right now. We're also the largest. And so we, our requirements are much larger. I would also tell them that you have more room to maneuver in the army around not only the different posts, but also uh, you can change your military specialty. You don't have to stay. Like I got to get two of them. Plus I got to do something called technical escort where you go down in the caves and you pull out and where they have labs and things like that. We do that um, also. 
So the Navy, yeah, that's great. Sit on a boat and float around. Oh, sorry, they're not boats. They're ships or vessels. I learned that when I worked down there. Um, they get offended if you call them boats. But also, um, yes, that's what I would tell them. What would you tell them? You are a recruiter. <laughs> One moment, Staff Sergeant here. So we do tailor each report, um, each appointment on a you know case by case, individual person. Um, we do talk to them and we ask them what are their goals, what is it that they're trying to attain? Because what the Army does that the other branches doesn't do, it allows you to pick your job, your MOS. So based on the qualifications, if you qualify and you pass the ASVAP, you know you on top of getting a bonus, you can also pick the job that you want. So there's some people that want to do human resources. And so if they meet the qualifications, um, then, you know, we can put them in as a 42 alpha, which is a human resource, which allows them to continue their degree in that field. So when they transition out, they are able to just, you know, use their certifications and degrees in the civilian sector as well. So that I would say that would be the biggest difference. And that's that's one mm -hmm. of our biggest selling points as well. Depending on what score, the tiers of the scores is what you have a whole slew of jobs they can pick from. Also, um, we also talk to the recruits about their family. Um, if you're a single parent, okay, we want you. We're gonna give your children health care. We're going to help you. We have something called a family care plan. I lost my husband uh, a couple of years ago. So I'm a single mother too. Uh, he passed away. So all of a sudden I became ignited into the family care plan, single parent. And that's when I'd always led soldiers and realized how much I relied on the army and what they gave me as a single parent. And so that is also something that we look at. Major Erickson, thank you for sharing such an inspiring testimonial. Carl, Carl Dawson will ask the final question. If you have additional questions, we ask that you stay for the purpose of time. We reach the bottom of the hour, Carl. I'm ready to join. <laughs> I'm okay. 65. Who do I sign up? Where do yeah. I sign up? I'm sorry, but you could be 38 and join. Because for certain MOSs right now, technical, medical field, uh, different fields, they're allowing people up to 38 join. But you could, you know, contribute in other ways by helping me get other people to join. I would rather go join. I know. I'll join twice being 65. So can... <laughs> Thank this you. is true. Thank you. How about another round of applause? Yeah, he does. How about another round of applause for Major Jillian Erickson, Staff Sergeant, Doctor? And uh, yes, please stand, thank please you. stand. And how about a <laughs> ovation for oh, our military thank personnel? I'd like to now send it back over to President Ike Sherlock. President. Thank you, thank you. Fantastic presentation, really appreciate it. I know there's other questions, so if you'd stick around after uh, to get to the other questions. Um, next week, uh, our speaker will be meeting right here at Tim Aquana. Our speaker is going to be Bishop Vaughn McLaughlin from Potter House. And um, I would like to ask Jay Hinderlight to come in, come up and lead us in the four-way test. While Jay's making his way up, let's remember to keep Ed Pratt Daniel in your prayers and get those texts to Ed. Hello, Rotarians. Please join me in the four-way test of the things we think, say, and or do. First, th second, third. Fourth. Thank you, Jay. Our quote of the day is a lie told often enough becomes the truth. Vladimir Lenin. That's good. Is it okay? Nice. Thank you. Army too. 12 Bravo South School. Wonderful. Thank you. Can you? I'm lucky I turned it on.